And this, I felt that was the reason why I was so close to, you know, so eager to discuss religion with others. But in any case, my my relationships, my friendships, went from one circle to another. And you know, when I look back, there was a definite sort of pattern to it in a religious sense. First, my friends, of course, were all fellow atheists in high school. Then I graduated high school. I got to the University of Connecticut, who's ranked 20th in the nation today in football, <laughs> and, um, and they're winning. And I got to the University of Connecticut, and I fell in with Jewish friends that I became very, very close to. Uh, you know, my Jewish friend, and then I married a Jewish girl, and I became part of a wonderful Jewish family, and, uh, but she was an atheist also. Uh, <laughs> I think I played a big part in that, <laughs> but she was an atheist, and it was, you know, it was a very nice relationship, but i tell you the truth, I just did not have an, uh, the ability to love anybody, really. I just couldn't find it in me. Because I learned that love just hurts. The object of your love could leave at any moment. Yeah. And you know, I know that goes back to the person I loved most of my life, you know, when I was growing up. But it was true. I just couldn't let myself give my feelings towards anyone. So the marriage ended two and a half years later on good terms. And uh, but it was a nice experience, a beautiful family. I left them. I got to learn a lot about the Jewish perspective much understood, much misunderstood. And then I left that family and um, and then I began to fall in with Buddhists and Hindus at uh, Purdue University, my, where I went to graduate school. And then towards the end, I met a couple of Muslims. And uh, to tell you the truth, their religion seemed no more irrational than anybody else's, and that surprised me because, you know, I had always felt that that was by far the most barbaric faith on here. But I realized that they have, a, they have a certain rationale and way of explaining themselves. And they were no near, were nearly as bad as I thought they would be. But when I went to the University of San Francisco to begin my first job as an assistant professor, uh, I sort of took up where I left off. And I got adopted, or I don't know if they adopted me or I adopted them. But I fell in with a Muslim family, and we became very close. And they were not much older than I was. Their father had died. Their oldest male, and that's an important position in a Muslim uh, Saudi Arabian family. The oldest male was about uh, 22, 23, about four years younger than I was. Uh, the oldest sister was about 25, 24, three, you know, just a few years younger than I was. They're all sort of my age. And of course they had a mom, who was quite a bit older, but she wasn't there when I first met them. So I fell in with them and we became very close. It was a wonderful relationship. And then we started talking about religion. Even though, you know, Mahmoud, our relationship began by him taking me to all the bars in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> but that made me feel safe with Mahmoud. <laughs> Good, this guy is nice. <laughs> Normal. You know, I mean, that's the way I thought. And, uh, and they were not very religious, so I liked them. So I felt comfortable talking to religion about them. And uh, we would discuss religion, and, uh, and I'd ask them questions and things like that. And then one day they asked me what I believe, what religion I believe. And I looked at them, and this was something I don't usually share with anybody. I usually kept that to myself. But I told them, well, frankly, I usually dodged the question, but this time I said, honestly, that's how close we were. I don't believe in God. And they looked at me like, you know, I just told them I was dying of cancer. <laughs> and they said, uh, why, why not? And I began to tell them. I just thought I'd give them a couple of indications. Well, you know, guys, there's so much violence in the world, and I just don't see how that, you know, how that, how that gels with the existence of an all-merciful, loving God. And then they would say, they would start arguing against me, and then I would start arguing back, and then I would uh, present more reasons and more reasons and more reasons, and then I'd be asked to start asking them questions. They'd get back in the corners and things like that. Finally, they said to me, Jeff, please not, after about three or four of these conversations, not talk about religion anymore. <laughs> doesn't seem to be doing us much good, and it doesn't seem to be doing you any good either. So, they asked me not to talk about religion anymore. And I felt ashamed of myself because 
In America, there's three things you don't talk about with other people. You know, I've, I've just sensitivity to others out of respect. You don't talk to them about what, how much money they make. You don't talk to them about what their politics are. And you don't talk to them about their religion. So, you know, I felt like, I felt ashamed. I felt awkward. So what I did was very awkward, discussing religion with them. I think their reaction was almost the same, but in reverse. I think they felt like, oh, we feel so ashamed with ourselves. We cut off the conversation. This guy wanted to talk. You know, the Saudis are so hospitable and so sensitive to their guests. I think they felt that they had offended me. In any case, and there's reasons for that later I found out, but in any case, to make a long story short, uh, I'm going to my office one day at the University of San Francisco, and I walk into my office at Harney Science Center, and I always leave the door unlocked. And you might think that's crazy, but I am the most scatterbrained person on earth. I lose my keys several times a day. <laughs> my mother says I'm the most absent-minded person in existence. She used to say if my head wasn't attached to my neck, I would have lost it long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember my mom saying she had a great sense of humor. In any case, and she had to deliver my dad. But in any case, so I left, always left the office door unlocked, and students would leave things in there, homework assignments, books. It became just common knowledge. Professor Lang's door is always open, even when he's not there. So in any case, I walk in this one morning, a couple weeks after the conversation with the, my Saudi friend, my new Saudi family, and I walk in, and there is a green text sitting on my desk. And I assumed it must be a math text or something similar, so I used to lost it. So I walk over and I look at the text and I look down and there on the cover it says something to this like the Holy Quran and English interpretation. And I looked at that and I stared at it and I just got angry. You know, there's one thing you don't want to do with an atheist. <laughs> Make him or her think that you're trying to push your religion on him. You know, and I thought, what do they mean by this? I think I stood there for about 15 minutes without sitting down, looking at the Quran, thinking, what do they mean by this? Do they think I'm trying to say I have to become a Muslim if our friendship is to continue? Are they trying to convert me to their faith? And I was really unnerved. Then I thought about it. Think about it rationally, Jeff. They go out the box. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen any of them pray, even though they talk about it. <laughs> During Ramadan, they ask me out for lunch. <laughs> They're not the most religious people in the world. I've never seen them trying to push the religion out of anybody else. They never even brought up the subject to me. I was always the one that initiated the conversation. I quickly realized this was a peace gesture. They felt they had offended me. They're giving me this copy of the Quran essentially to say, yeah. We can't, we don't have a clue about the kind of questions you'd answer. And we're sorry we had to cut off the conversation, but if you're really interested in that at all in our religion, here's a copy of the Quran. <laughs> you know, dump it on his desk, that's the end. And they never brought it up, and I didn't bring it up either. They just received it as a gift, although I did find out that they were the ones that dropped it off there. I received it as a gift, and I put it on my shelf, and I thought, someday I'll take this glance at. You know, just out of curiosity. I mean, I'm fascinated by religion. But things got busy. Weeks went by. But then I ran out of stuff to read because I had chipped all my books from Purdue University because I was a poor graduate student. The cheapest method possible. And they told me that it would take two, three months to get there. But now it was like six months and they still hadn't arrived. And I had given up hope. And I loved to read. I had nothing to read. And the few books I did bring with me, I had long, I would read some of them twice by now. Magazines were read. I'm sitting in my apartment in Diamond Heights one night, nothing to read. I turn on the Johnny Carson show, watch for 15 minutes, turn it on. And I look over to my left, and there on the coffee table, and somehow I moved it to the coffee table, was the green text, and on it said an English interpretation of the Holy Quran, something like that. The Holy Quran and English interpretation. So I thought I would pick it up, just have a quick glance 